The Mishnah and Sanhedrin says, Elan Amar and Bechalashon, these are said in any language, Parsha Sota, when the Sota is brought to the temple, there you have to read the Torah portion about the Sota. Vidu Maser, Vidu Maser, when you bring the, the uh, this is about getting rid of Maser from the previous year, or maybe it's even about Bikurim, about the first fruits. Kriyat Shema, the um, reading of the Shema, right? So you see here that the Shema can be in any language. Utfila and prayer could be in any language. Ubir Karamazam and Benchim could be in any language. Shvula Saeed is Shvula Sapikada. And an oath that you have to make uh, in Bezin can be in any language. So the Gemara says, Tfila Bechalashan, prayer in any language. Vamar Yehuda, Allah Olam Al Yishalam Tarkal Blush, Al Yishalam Tarkal Blush and Aramis. So the Gemara asks, Rav Yehuda says, How can you do it in any language? I mean, Gemara says, how can you do it in any language? You know, Rabbi Yehuda said, you could do it in any language except for one language. Don't do it in Aramit. Don't do it in Aramaic. I'm Rabbi Yochanan. Because if you do it in Aramaic, the angels are not going to be helpful to bring your prayer up to a higher level because angels do not understand Aramaic. Uh, so it's hard to know. Is this because they spoke Aramaic? What they're saying is angels only speak Hebrew? Or they're saying specifically, actually, I think what it usually is taken to mean is that specifically Aramaic angels do not understand. Why that is a different question. They don't, it doesn't really answer it. They don't, they, they just don't know Aramaic. Um, so the Gemara says, what do we do with this idea that uh, you see that um, the Mishnah says you pray in any language? Rebuta says, no, you can't pray in Aramaic. So the Gemara says, Lakashi habi yachid habit sibor. One is talking about a congregation. One is talking about an individual. And it's not what we would think, right? We would think that a, uh, let's pull up the Gemara. We would think that, um, So we would, we would think that uh, uh, maybe the congregation could, you know, should pray in Hebrew, but an individual maybe should pray, could be able to pray in any language, even Aramaic. But it's actually the opposite of what the Gemara is saying. The Gemara is saying that a congregation can pray in any language because they have the power to bring up their prayer on their own. But as an individual, they don't have the power as much to transcend the physical and bring the prayer up to God. They need the help of the angels, and therefore they should not pray in Aramaic. They should pray either in Hebrew, uh, and, and maybe it's just comparing Hebrew and Aramaic. Maybe that's it. Maybe, no, maybe what it's saying is that the angels understand Aramaic, and so an individual should only pray in uh, Aramaic. Let's actually look at the Gemara. Okay. Where is this hub? Lokashi hub biyachet hub tzibur. Rashi says. The individual needs the help of the angels. But a congregation doesn't need the help of the angels. And it brings Pasuk and Eov, Eov to prove that. Um, are we talking about every language or are we just talking about Aramaic? So we sort of take this as, as Aramaic represents every language. The um, so it's funny you you write the argument that's going on in 1820 is an argument over the tzibor over the congregation, right? So let's keep that in mind, right? Now in the Gemara we are more inclined to let a congregation pray in the vernacular, not an individual. An individual should pray in Hebrew because their prayer is more tenuous. So uh, here it is in Halacha, Orachayim. This is the Shulchan Aruch, this is Rabbi Yosef Cairo. Yachal, right, writing in the early 1500s, Yachal is palel b'chol You can pray in any language that you want. But that's talking about a congregation. A congregation can pray in any language, Hebrew, Aramaic, German. But an individual should only pray in Hebrew. So it's not the difference between Aramaic and all other languages, it's between all other languages, Aramaic represents other languages, and Hebrew. He says, maybe this only means when you're asking for your needs. 
when you're praying for an individual issue. But if something is a fixed prayer for the congregation, right? If he's saying if it's the Amida or or maybe even Shema, um, if it's the Amida, and even an individual should be able to do it in any language, right? That's it. he's being he's saying you know not only can a congregation in any language, even an individual can if it's a very regular fixed prayer. If it's a special prayer. Individual should do it in Hebrew, congregation can do it in any language. And there are those that say that even an individual can pray in any language, except for Aramaic, right? In other words, the question is, do angels understand uh, only Hebrew? Or, and therefore an individual should pray in Hebrew, or no, angels understand every language except for Aramaic. So that's obviously the argument in the end that he's quoting. Okay, so this is early 1500s. The Magan Avram right, the 1600s. So he comments here, in any language, the Sefer Mitzvah, is probably quoting the Sefer Mitzvah of the Rambam, uh, that it's uh, good to pray in any uh, language that you understand if you don't understand Hebrew. It's better to understand it. Biyachid in individuals. Shein Malachi Yisrael is kach in the shar of the shanas because angels don't understand any other language except Hebrew. Avul b'tzibra kadosh baruch hu ba'atzim akavus v'atzim. But since the congregation's prayers go directly to God, they can pray in any language. The af yachid, even an individual, uh, if it's a fixed prayer, the Shulchan Aruch said even an individual could pray uh, in any in any language. Desvio de melacha makir mecholasha holds that the angels understand every language, um, except they don't understand Aramaic. So if it's a different language, that would be fine. That's the Makhlok yet. Uh, we're talking about um, Hebrew versus Aramaic or Hebrew versus every other language. But either way, there's a lot of, a lot of, it doesn't seem the conclusion that you could pray in any language, even a congregation, even an individual could pray in any language, uh, if it's a fixed prayer, seems to be fairly obvious so far. The El Yarava, 16, uh, uh, early 1700s, Bavaria. But Tzibor, a congregation, Shetfilas Tzibor, where we said a Tzibor can pray, uh, Tzibor can pray in any language, a congregation can pray in any language, Shetfilas Tzibor in the Tzibor, because a, a, a congregation doesn't need angels to bring the prayer up, as it says in the Gemara and Soto, which we just learned. Um, exactly that. So, so far, there's no resistance to, um, uh, these are the classic commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, right? Before the modern period, I mean, there's not one, right? There's not one intimation here of it's better to pray in Hebrew. Now here's the Mishnah Baruch. Mishnah Baruch lived, uh, he died in 1930, right? He is a very authoritative commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, but he's very late. Here's what he writes. B'chol in any language, right? We said that a congregation pray in any language. Oh, the best way to do it is Hebrew. And that's quite different, by the way, from what the what we just saw, which uh, basically was saying that if you understand it, that's uh, the language you understand is better, right? The Magan Avram had said that actually um, a, a, a congregation can pray in any language and it's better to pray in a language you understand if you don't understand Hebrew. Okay. But the Mishnah Baruch says, no, it's better to pray in Hebrew. The Mishnah Baruch, and he says, and then he quotes a source. The source is an earlier uh, piece of, shul, of commentary on the Shulchan Aruch from 30 chapters earlier. But who's he quoting? Himself. The Mishnah Baruch is Sham, He says, I wrote earlier in the name of the Achron, the name of the later authorities. What's an achron? An achron usually means somebody from after 1500. But, but when, right? There's a lot of, between 1500 and 1930 is a long time. Sofer. He quotes the chasam sofer. Or rechaim. Pei dalid peivav. Who's the chasam sofer? Well, the chasam sofer lives in, in, the, in the early to mid 1800s and lives in Pressburg, writes a letter in the, in the Eilat Divrei Habris for the Hamburg Vesden and champions the war against the reform. That's the Mishnah Bruce quote. 
Sharach Bakam Arayas, and he brings many proofs, the Mishnah Bura says, we should look this up. Demasha Tiwil Ispal Bakalashan, that that which the Shulchan Arucha and the Gemara permits you to pray in any language, Dafkuba Kroy, that's only once in a while. That's only if you have to, because of something that happened. Avalik Boa, the Kavius, Timidos, the Hamid Shatz, the Shkech, Lashon HaKodesh. But if you want to make a permanent uh, rule that a synagogue is going to pray in another language, in German, that is impossible in any situation. Look at that. He quotes our book, the Divrei Habris. And he says, by the way, the Gaone Hasman, the rabbis of the great rabbis of our time, have written in Eilat Divrei Habris. Baskimu, and they've all agreed, Shasser, Isser Gomrahu Lasas came, that it's forbidden to pray in another language as a congregation. Blafuke Mikitot Chadashot, in order to stay away from the new groups, Shinifritza Mechutza Medina, that have popped up and multiplied outside of the Medina, outside of our country. Batiku. As call, I, I guess in 1930, he lives in Raden. Raden, I guess, is not much reform. And they have they've changed the, the prayers, into praying in the language of the people. And one sin causes another. What happened? It's a slippery slope. They took out the blessing of, you know, of God redeeming us. And God should return us to Jerusalem, right? In other words, they, first they change the language, and then they get rid of the blessings to fit a theology uh, that's anti-Messianic. Since they want to forget Jerusalem, this is very interesting. He says, just like they want to forget Jerusalem, that's why they're forgetting Hebrew. Uh, right? In other words, it's just like they, they want to get rid of the things that label us as Jews, basically Israel and Hebrew. Pen yigalu, right? Why do they want to do that? Pen yigalu bizachus shalo shino es lashona. This is very interesting. There's a medrash that says that the Jews were redeemed from Egypt in the merit that they did not change their names and they didn't change their language, right? They didn't, they spoke Hebrew. Well, um, so he says, the reformer are afraid that we're going to be redeemed. And therefore, they get rid of the bracha of redemption and they get rid of the Hebrew language because it's in merit of speaking Hebrew, of retaining the Hebrew language, that the Jews are going to be redeemed. God should guard us from the apikorsim uh, like these and look in the Ber Halacha. Ber Halacha was also written by the Mishnah Baruch. So he quotes himself. I am the mission of Baruch. Look at the mission of Baruch. Chasab b'magan Avram b'shem sefer chasidim nimetul ispal b'lashon shemayim. And then he quotes the magan Avram that we just saw. That it's better to pray in a language you understand if you don't understand Hebrew. Muchu b'sefer chasidim simintav kos peiches tahenu tafim who. Um, imhu, who, not sure what that is. Ratzon the kavana. That's if you're going to have more kavana. If you're not going to have more kavana in another language, pray in Hebrew. Because lashon hakodesh Hebrew has all these mystical things. And um, who's he quoting now? Sefer Hasidim. Sefer Hasidim is a, it's a very interesting question. Is Sefer Hasidim a normative halachic book uh, that you can use as a source? What is Sefer Hasidim? Sefer Hasidim is a book from the 1100s written by, there was a group of German pietists that were kind of radical. Uh, they, they were not necessarily mainstream, um, although they do get quoted a lot. Uh, they had some customs that were very strange, uh, but it's interesting, right? In other words, there's, if you're quoting Sefer Hasidim, there's not a lot of source. That's what that means, right? In other words, it, this, is, this is not a mainstream 
right? The mainstream halacha is pray in any language. And even if an individual can't, a community definitely can. The Mishnah Brewer, though, is, right, he quotes the Chassam Sofer, and he quotes Sefer Chassidim. Um, now, I'm not arguing against, I'm not arguing for, you know, for changing the language of prayer into German or English. I don't think we should do that. But, um, but I just want to see all this in context. Uh, and, 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 and I'm not, I'm not decrying a battle against the, I'm not saying Mr. Burr shouldn't have waged a battle against the reform or the Chassam Sofer shouldn't have. The truth is they were right. It is an incredibly slippery slope. And very quickly the reform, you know, wanted to do away with circumcision and Shabbos on Saturday. And, and, uh, you know, I used to live in St. Louis. There were reform synagogues that had prayer services on Sunday uh, until they, you know, changed it later. Uh, as they became a little bit more traditional. So, so yes, you know, the, the reform movement definitely was a slippery slope. No question, it's the slipperiest slope, no question about it. Um, but, but I want to see the methodology. So I think that's very important to, uh, to realize that, um, that the Chavetz Chaim struggling here. The, the author of the Mishnah Bura is struggling here. Right? He's struggling to find a source that will say you need to dive it in Hebrew. Uh, and, and, and quoting the Chassam Sofer and Sefer Chassidim, right? I, I hate to say it, but right, he, for good reason, he's trying to grasp at straws um, because he, need, he wants a source because he wants to stem the tide of, of this reformation. Um, and, and realize that, you know, I mean, 1930 already is very, very late. I mean, it's already 100 years later. I mean, you know, that's, but in 1920, to have this argument is a lot harder. So that's what we're going to see. We'll, we'll do a little bit more. But I did want to show you that in the, the commentaries on the Shulchan Arach, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it, everybody's fine with, with, in theory, praying in another language, even a whole community praying in another language. None of the mainstream commentaries on Shulchan Aruch that I saw here, the main ones, none of them say it's either better to pray in Hebrew or that uh, it's only for a one-time thing. They, they don't say that. Mishra Bruce says that, who lives in 1930. But, um, but they don't say that, you know, but until you get to the modern. Why don't they say that? The answer is because in the 1600s, if a community wants to pray in, in the vernacular, maybe it doesn't matter. You know, maybe that's a, Now, the truth is that communities did it. I don't think they did. You know, I think you go to Prague in the 1600s, people prayed in, in Hebrew. Uh, I think Spartan prayed. I think everybody prayed in Hebrew. And thank God they did. I mean, you know, I, I think it's, it's, there's obviously something very powerful and important about Jews all praying in the same language. Um, I, I don't think Jews on the ground as a community ever did. And, and as, I think it's actually reversed from the Gemara. I think individuals probably prayed in, in the regular language and communities always prayed in Hebrew, even though the Gemara says an individual should only pray in Hebrew and a community could pray in any language, um, right? I'm, I'm sure it wasn't that way. The, um, but um, but it's, it's, it, we just need to, again, put ourselves in the shoes of, of each generation. And um, you know, 16 or 17 hundreds, they're not fighting that battle. Uh, it, it's really later that, um, that it comes up and we'll, and, and, We'll just do a little bit more on the Shulchan Aruch, and then we'll look at uh, Ela de Vreabris and Cherub Nakam de and see how do they how do they treat this differently. I mean, it's, and and my point basically is that they're just coming from totally different points of view. In other words, you can do you can you can. It's harder to argue that prayer needs to be in Hebrew. I think from the sources, um, I think the Chassam Sofer has the need to do that, and the Mishnah Bruin needs to do that because they're trying to stop the Reformation, and and rightly so. Um, and the reform is, you know, in certain sense, it's an easier time with the sources. Um, they are trying, you know, I think in 1820, the reform is also honest about this. I think they want, they think it's better for the Jews. I think they think it's better for prayer. And is that true? It probably is true. You know, if the Jews don't understand Hebrew, you know, one thing is to say, oh, let's teach Jews Hebrew or, you know, another is to say, let's do it. I mean, so we, you know, because we live at a time of, of printing being cheap, you have to remember also that that you know in the in the 1700s printing was very expensive. Uh, paper was extreme. Paper was so expensive it was con- a blank piece of paper was considered muktzi. You wouldn't touch it because it was worth so much uh, on Shabbat. So, um, but you know, I mean, for us, we can just print in you know Hebrew and English and any language you want, and you know, it's a totally different world. Okay. Have a good uh, good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.